Take your Bible, turn to Genesis 1. We are learning Bible doctrine. And we're going to discuss uh, for the next few... Oh, I have handout. JR, on my desk, I have a stack of papers. They're all stapled. And it has all of these notes on it. So if you would get those and hand those out to anybody that wants them. Should have enough for everybody. Hopefully you have enough for everybody. So, um, if we're going to learn, if we're going to learn doctrine, let's learn about the primary reason why we are even here tonight. We assume that we know who God is. We assume it, but let's learn it like we've never learned it before. All right. When, um, Thank you. I don't need one. I've got one. Uh, and basically what you're going to see there is what I have up here. But we're going to uh, take this and make it available on Sermon Audio uh, when we post this and the other messages. And then we thought about uh, making this into something that we could give to the pastors in Kenya uh, because um, we've kind of put off our meeting with them there uh, while I try to develop this. But we're going to look at all of the things that I had to learn uh, as a young preacher. When I was uh, 16 years old, I knelt at this altar, and I felt like God was calling me to preach the gospel. And so um, this church submitted my name to the denomination at the time, and they set me aside for six months, and that was a time of examination. And I had to learn our doctrine. And I had to, I mean, I had to learn it, learn it. And so it was at that time you went through the official doctrines. In other words, the attributes of God. Who is God? What can God do? What is it that God doesn't do? Who is Christ? Who is the Holy Spirit? What the Holy Spirit does. What the Holy Spirit never does. All right? And so we're going we're gonna to learn all that. We started out with salvation, but now we're going to move into who is God. So you can do one of two things or both things simultaneously. You can refer to your sheet because I have the verses printed out there. Those of you watching online, the verses will be on your screen. Um, or you can follow along as we go to each one of these verses uh, in your Bible you are welcome to take that sheet, make some notes on anything that I say or anything that pops into your head, so on and so forth. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. It's good to see you here tonight. I'm glad that you're here. And uh, then we'll have our prayer time at the end of this lesson. I appreciate you all being here tonight. Heavenly Father, it's good to come into your house. It's good to be with your people. It's good, Father, to learn these things. Uh, these are the fundamentals. These are things, Father, that your word teaches us, and we believe them. We believe them, Father, because you have instilled them in our hearts. You have called us unto faith, and we believe not what man says, but what the scripture says. So, Father, we pray, God, that you would open up our eyes. I pray, Lord, that if there's something that we go through tonight that we already know, Father, it'd be a blessing that we remember the things that we once learned and were once taught. But Father, if there's something tonight that someone doesn't know, I pray, dear God, that you would fill their mind and their heart and their soul with knowledge. And knowledge, Father, brings us uh, to a greater relationship with you. We want to know who our God is. And we take it for granted that we live in a world where everybody should know who God is, but unfortunately they don't. So I pray, God, that you would allow these lessons uh, to be a blessing to those who have never heard the gospel, do not know what Christianity is about. I pray, Lord, that this would be a blessing to them as they learn it with us. Father, we do ask you bless your word tonight. And let your Holy Spirit guide our hearts and teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Um, the basis of what I'm going to show you tonight, of course, uh, we could start out in uh, 2 Timothy 
I'll just read that for you very quickly, or you can turn there along with me. Uh, 2 Timothy, let me get there very quickly. 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Let's see, where is it? There, here it is. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. So we believe then that the Bible is our lesson book. It has everything that God wants us to know. I believe it has everything that is of God. And uh, there's always issues that people look in the scripture and they say, I wonder if you know, they look at a story and they ask, I wonder if this happened along with what the Bible says. Well, I've learned that if God is silent on something, we probably should be too. Okay? It's not like God wrote the Bible but forgot to put some things in it. If it's important to God, it's in His Word. If it's not important to God, then it shouldn't be important to us. But I've found that sometimes people argue not over what God said, but some things that God didn't say. As if, and they argue about it as if he said it. So everything that we need to know about God doesn't come to us from fuzzy feelings. Or it doesn't come to us from the world. Because the world may have a different idea of who God is than what the Bible is. Because you'll hear out in the world, well, we all worship the same God. Do we not? Well... The Bible then tells us about the God that we believe in. And if the God that we believe in does not match the God that everybody else believes in, then obviously we don't worship the same God. I'll give you an example. We believe that God has an only begotten son. His name is Jesus Christ. Muslims, and they're very picky about this, Muslims say Allah had no son. So... Our God had a son, their God does not have a son. Then that means that their God is not the same as our God. Okay? I don't know if Buddha had a son or not. Never looked into that. Maybe somebody could look that up. All right? But anyway, so that's why we're going to learn what we're going to learn tonight. Genesis chapter 1, the question is, who is God? So the very first verse of the Bible... The very first chapter, the very first place you open up, if you're going to read the Bible, is Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, in this one verse, these ten words here, it encompasses everything that God made, which is everything. It mentions the heaven and it mentions the earth. So there really isn't, to our knowledge, there isn't anything beside the heaven and the earth. So it means that God created absolutely everything that is. And we're going to see a verse here in a little bit that actually substantiates that. So let's look at God then as the creator. And is it important? I, I think we touched on this Sunday night because we're kind of going through Genesis. How important is it that we understand if that God is the creator of everything? I think it's very important because if God didn't create everything then God doesn't have rights over everything. If there's something that God did not create, then God doesn't have a right over that. So God created it, so God has a right over it. And we'll study that too. So Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, Hast thou not known, and I'm going to move through, believe it or not, I'm going to try to move through some of these verses quickly. There's a lot of them. I'm going to try not to expound on every single word of every single verse. Isaiah 40, 28, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Now, there's several things in this verse. I am going to expound on this a little bit that teaches us about God. Number one, God is everlasting, meaning that everlasting means both before time and after time. Now, I can't fathom that, but God always was, God always is, and God always will be. He's everlasting. Number two, He is the Lord, 
which means that he is the governor over all of his creation. He is God over every single atom, every molecule, every person, and every creature. He is the creator of it. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. So where, as far as the earth is round, God is the creator of everything in the earth. And then it says, he fainteth not, neither is weary. What does that tell you? Where it says, God fainteth not, neither is weary. What does that say to you? He doesn't get tired. God never sleeps. God never takes a nap. God never is caught off guard. God, after doing all the things that God does for thousands of years, he's never got, the Bible says he holds the universe in the span of his hand, but God has never gotten tired of holding the universe in the span of his hand. So he's never, ever tired. And then there is no searching of his understanding. So what does that tell you? You cannot, you'll never outsmart God, number one. And God's knowledge is absolutely without any limit. There is absolutely nothing that God does not know. Uh, Isaiah 40, ver, or 42 verse 5. Thus saith, the, thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out. So the Bible says in the previous verse that God created the ends of the earth. Now in this verse, we see that he's created that, and it mentions heavens as plural. So we know that there is the first heaven, which is the atmosphere around the earth. Number two, there is the realm of what we would call outer space or the universe. That's the second heaven. The third heaven that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12 the third heaven is where God himself dwells. And each heaven that you go to is smaller than the next one. In other words, the first heaven is, I mean, it's big to us, but it's smaller than space. And outer space in the universe is actually smaller than the heaven of heavens where God dwells in. So God created all of those places, which begs the question, if God created even his own dwelling place, where did he dwell before that? Whew. Don't ask. We'll ask God when we get there. Amen. So he, he created the heavens and he stretched them out, which is something that scientists even now know. Our knowledge of the universe is increasing because we have telescopes now that can see farther and farther and farther. And uh, 150, 200 years ago, the universe was nowhere near as big as it is now, according to our understanding. And we know that God is the one who took them and stretched them all out. He that spread forth the earth. You ever seen that line where it looks like South America fits into Africa? I think it did. And I think at one point, according to Genesis, the Bible says when in the days of uh, Peleg, when he was born, that's when the, the earth was divided. So he even stretched out the earth and spread it forth that that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it and the spirit to them that walk therein. Isaiah 45 verse 6. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. What does that tell you about God? Look at, the, look at the, how it's phrased. There is none beside me. Huh? He has no equal. When you're by somebody's side, like God being up on a throne or a pedestal, if there was another God with him, then there would be a God that would be equal to him. But according to this, there is no equal to God. He has no body either that is equal to him or no God that is higher than him. And in this, this then separates our God from the Mormon God. Who's the Mormon God? The Mormon God used to be a man, according to Mormonism, used to be a man like us that lived on a planet. And when he died and went to the celestial kingdom, he then was made a God over his own planet. And our God over this planet came from another planet called Kolob. 
There's a statement in Mormonism that says, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man will be. So the Mormon God has equals. Our God does not. Okay? So, I mean, this is why I think it's important to separate out what it is that we believe about God. We do not believe that our God is the same as everybody else's God. Uh, let's see here. Uh, where was we? Isaiah 40, 45, 6, that you may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. I form the light. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. And create darkness. So God created light. God created darkness. It's hard to even perceive of anything before the creation where even darkness did not exist. But he said, I created darkness. I make peace and create evil. Now this is, I've been challenged on this verse. I mean, I believe what it says. How does God create evil? How would God create evil? Do what? Okay, he has evil angels, but how did God himself create evil? Choice. So he puts a tree in the midst of the garden called the tree of life. And he puts a tree of knowledge of good and evil next to it in the midst of the garden. And he says, you may eat freely of one, but you may not eat of the other. And thus God creates evil by creating something by, by a law. By giving a commandment. Um, was there a time when they built roads that they didn't have a speed limit on some of these roads? If there's no speed limit, that you can't break a law on them. You can't break the limit. So there's no evil. So God creates evil by giving a commandment to do something or not to do something and then giving man the choice to either do it or not do it. And that's what God did. So God, and because, and I was asked this exact question or told this exact thing because a woman chewed me out one time and said, God doesn't create evil. And she used those exact words. And I went, oh yeah, you did. Of course, they never responded. So I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation. Let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created... Look at all the things that God created. The heavens He created. The skies that pour down. He created righteousness. If God creates evil, then God also creates good and righteousness. Let the earth open. God created that. Let them bring forth salvation. God created salvation. By giving us a savior. Let righteousness, he created that, spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. So when you have good and evil, light and darkness, black and white, whatever it is, there is nothing that God did not. If it exists, God created it. If it exists, God created it. Isaiah 45, 8. Did I already look at that verse? I did it double. There we go. Isaiah 45, 12. I have made the earth and created man upon it. This is very important. If man believes that he was not created to be on this earth. And the next thing we're going to look at is God as the judge. Because if God created it, then he has rights to govern it. If he has rights to govern it, then he has to judge between those who do right and those who do wrong. And let's face it. Our, our public morality has declined. The morality in our schools has declined. Morality among children has declined drastically because we have taught them as a society, we have taught children that there is no God, there is no creator, that they evolved from a lower life form 
and that when they die, there is nothing after that. So, they think then that they can live their life however they choose to live their life. They can create their own sense of morality. They can make up their own rules. They can judge themselves and they say, no man judges me. No man has rights over me. Nobody has authority over me. And so when each one of those people die, they think that's it. But it's not. Because at the end of everybody's life, because God created them and God has rights over them and God has the right to govern them, then God will judge them on the things that they did in this life. So he said, I created man upon it. I even my hands, there he says it again, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. So here, God makes man, but then he makes all of the stars that are in the sky. And he calls them the host. And he says that they don't move in the universe, but what I command them to move. So there's a religion called astrology that says that the outcome of your life depends on the motions of the stars and the planets. So if the planets and the stars are in this particular position, facing in this direction, moving in this course on this particular day, then that determines the outcome of your day. But those stars did not decide to move on their own. God is the one who moves them. God is the one. You look out at the moon. The moon has all these big craters on it. And those craters are large chunks of space debris that get caught into the moon's gravity, hit it at a force of 100,000 miles an hour plus, and it creates a big hole there. All right? Well, God is the one who steered the course of that particular rock into that moon. That's how specific... God is with his creation. How many pieces of rock are there in the universe? This is my point. God governs every single... Look at that verse. He said, I even, I even my hands have stretched out the heavens and all their hosts have I commanded. God governs every planet, every star, the motion of every rock, every meteor, every particle of dust. God commanded it. It doesn't move except God tells it to move, when to move, where to move, how fast to move, and where to stop. That's a big God. But that's the one we believe in. Amen? How, is God getting bigger in your mind tonight? I hope so. So, uh, let's see here. Verse 18 of same chapter. Isaiah 45, 18. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens... God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, which means that he set it in its course. The particular movements of the sun, moon and stars, all the planets, the earth. God is the one who has ordained every one of their motions. He established it and he created it not in vain. What does that mean? He created it not in vain. Take a guess. Caleb. Not in a bad way. Okay. He created it for... To... to huh? A purpose. A purpose. What? To last? Maybe. Maybe. Do what? Right. He had a reason for it. What about all the stars that we can't even see? There's a reason. He created it not in vain. And then he says, he formed it, talking about the earth, to be inhabited. When he created the heaven and the earth on day one of creation, and he said, let to be light, let, and there was light. Then on day two, he divided the waters and separated the earth. Then when on day three, then God starts planting trees and grass and shrubs and algae and 
all of this stuff all over the earth. Tomatoes and strawberries and cucumbers. God planted everything. He planted it to be inhabited. Then he put fish in the sea and fowl in the air. And then he put beasts on the earth. And then he created us. He creates his universe for things to live in. This is very important. Because God is a God of life. He's a God of life. God creates life, but in creating life, He creates a place for that life to dwell in first. He thought this all out very well. So He created everything to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. There He is saying it again. So did God have someone helping him create all of these things? No. Um, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, I mean, they were great thinkers of the day. They helped form the laws of our country. But if you ask them if they believe in God, they would say yes, but they were deists. And what that means is they believed that, yes, God created everything. But then he took his hands off of creation and let it guide itself. That the stars, the sun, the moon, the planets, the crickets, the grasshoppers, the birds, the fish, and us get to do whatever we want, however we want, in any way that we want. That's what essentially deism is. That God created it. Yes, it had to have creator. But God doesn't really oversee and govern the affairs of this earth. Okay? And that's not, from what we're reading, that's not correct. Not only does God create it, but He governs every single atom of it. There's none of it that falls outside of His governance. Isaiah 65, 17, not only does God create this heaven and this earth, but Isaiah 65, 17 he said, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now, I didn't add this in here, but take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 21. This is God promising that he is that there is an end to this world. And think about it. Everything that we know about this world and this universe is that things have an end. Our scientists, our astronomers are able to look out even at stars that they say have come to an end. What is a... Let me ask our young people, what is a nova or a supernova? What is it? A what? No. What is a supernova? Does anybody know? Explosion. Explosion of what? Thermite, dynamite? A star. A star whose life ended in a massive... See, that's how I want to go. Massive blaze of glory. But a, a nova or a supernova is a star whose mass became so much that it literally collapsed in on itself, imploded, debris went everywhere. They can see that. Okay? So everything about this universe, from, from the farthest thing that we can see to the closest thing we can see, it tells us that everything in this universe ends it stops it has a cutting off time so god already promised that the world wasn't going to end with another flood he's already done that so how is the world going to end okay so hold your place there in revelation look in second peter The, and this all goes into the nature of God. 
2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that, a, that one day is with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We'll get into that. Verse 10 tells us the end. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens, the heavens, the universe, the cosmos, shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements, what's he mean by that? I think he means that very fundamental building blocks of everything, what are elements? Let me hear from my students. What are some of the elements? Yes. Huh? Carbon. carbon. It's, what, it's a lot of what we're made of. We're carbon-based. Give me another element. Oxygen. Hydrogen. Lead. Gold. Silver. Helium. Sulfur. These are all the base elements, the base building blocks of everything in our universe. And I don't think we've discovered all of them yet. But one of these days, with a great, tremendous, I mean, think about it. We already know what happens when you split an atom. What happens? Not just boom. Kaboom. What does it release? A tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of heat, and a tremendous Four, a loud noise. So look at your Bible. So the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So it's like God is going to split every atom in throughout the universe. And that's going to be the biggest bomb ever. The loudest noise, the biggest blast, and the most heat. So everything that you've done down here, everything you've built Everything that you thought, everything you were a part of is gone. Some people like to think that they want to live their life so much that people will build a monument to them so that when they die, their name will continue on. That's vanity. It's vanity. Because once God is done with this world and this universe, boom, dissolved into absolutely Nothing. So then, Revelation 21, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I like this, verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither see, that death is an end. And what God's going to do with the next heaven and earth is eliminate endings. No death, nothing finishes, nothing stops, nothing dr fades away, nothing rots, corrupts, nothing dies, nothing ever ends. It is what men have sought for eternity in this world, is they've sought immortality. And we're on the verge of science giving man a false sense of immortality. But even God, who is the creator of that, is going to end even that. But he's, when he ends, God always gives a new beginning. Okay, that's the nature of God. What he ends, he gives something new. Our loved ones, people that we cared about, people that we loved, even though they've ended, God has given them something brand new. All right, back to our notes. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Does that mean that everything that we're doing tonight, we're going to forget about? I think so. And why not? Why not? 
Is there not enough things that have happened to us in this life that we would love to forget about? Love for it to pass away completely. Absolutely. And to think about an eternity where our minds are focused on the newness of heaven that never goes away. Newness that never ends. So it's like there wouldn't even be any time to think about things that have passed away. Okay? You don't remember them anymore. Malachi chapter 2. Have we not all one Father? And that part, yes, everybody on the earth is kin to everybody else in the earth. Now think about it. Now I got, there are things about other people that they do that I do not like. But God made them the same as he made me. So there is only one God. And everybody that has lived, lives now, or will live, God is the Father of every one of them. Is that doctrinally correct? Look at Luke chapter 3. Who was everybody's... Who was the first man? I'll ask it that way. First man. What's his name? Adam. Now here... I believe this is important. They tell us that we all came from like a Neanderthal man and all of that stuff. Which one? Which Neanderthal man did we all come from? They don't know. And some of them even say that there was a time when a Neanderthal man and a, what's the other ones? Some of the later forms, Cro-Magnon man or whatever, that they existed for a period simultaneously. Okay, so you have all of these proto-humans walking around. Which one was the father of every human being that's on this planet? They cannot identify that. I can I can show you the man that everybody, the man who carried every one of us in his loins. His name was Adam. And look what your Bible says about that Adam. In Luke chapter 3, it gives us the lineage of Jesus, starting in verse um, 23. Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And if you skip on down to verse 38, it traces the lineage all the way past Abraham, all the way past uh, Noah. Uh, in verse 37, in verse 36, you have Noah, then you have Lamech, then Methuselah, Enoch, Jared, Mah Malaleel, Canaan, Enos, Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So in a literal sense, Adam was a son of God. So when this verse says, have we not all one father? Yes, if we all descended from Adam, then Adam was our father, but God was his father. Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. And that is a great scripture. I mean, if I had a brother, which I don't, we might kind of fight, pick on each other every now and then, but we're brothers, we would get along. My sister and I, we pick on each other every now and then, but we're brother and sister. We love one another. And I would defend her and she would defend me. Why don't we all do that with one another? It's a noble idea. Unfortunately, sin gets involved in it. But you understand the concept, right? God, we didn't just evolve from nothingness God had an intention when he created Adam and because he created Adam and since we all came from Adam, that means we are all brethren. And even when God wiped out 
all of the earth and left Noah and his three sons. There are three races on the earth, just like there were three sons to be the fathers of those races. But they were all brothers and they all came from one Noah. So we are still all brothers. Amen. Now, John chapter one. Turn there because now we're going to bring in a further identification of this God. John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word. Now, very important language here. In the beginning, the word already was. So we're talking about before time. When God created this universe, he created it in time, linear time. God started a clock and started time in motion. Time's a very difficult concept to grasp. But before this creation was eternity. Past, eternity present, eternity whatever. And the Bible is telling you that before the creation, the word of God was already in existence. And we know who that word is. Who is that word? It's Jesus. So this helps answer a question that some might have. Who is Jesus? Is he a lesser than God? No, because what I learned was the attributes that are applied to God the Father, the same attributes are applied equally to Jesus the Son and also to the Holy Ghost. So they really are three, but they are one. Can we understand it? No. Can we believe it? Yes, we believe it. So in the beginning, here's the beginning. This is nothing exists. Now everything exists, but the word already was. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God, meaning God the Father. And the word was God. The same, meaning the word, was, was in the beginning with God. So Christ, the Word of God, the Son of God, and God already in existence before God created everything else. And it's very important because people will then say G Jesus was created by God. That's what the Jehovah's Witness believe and that's what a lot of the Hebrew roots cultists believe. They, they will, anytime you reduce the gospel, you reduce who Christ is. So they reduce Christ down to a creation of God, saying Christ showed up at the moment of creation. No, he didn't. Not according to this. This is why the Jehovah's Witness had to insert the letter A in verse 1. And the word was a God to them. Then that changes everything in the Bible to Jesus was created as a lesser God on the day of creation. And that's not true. The same was in the beginning with God, all things, all things. Underline that phrase, all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. God is the creator. If it exists, God created it. And if it doesn't exist, then God didn't create it because he didn't need it. If God needs it, he'll make it. And what did he, here's something else important. What did he, Spencer, give, I'll give you five free videos. If you can tell me what God created everything out of. What did God create everything that is out of? Elements. No, he created elements. Yes, JR. Nothing. Oh, I see. Nothing. The Latin phrase they use in, in uh, scholarly circles, ex nihilo. Nada. Nil. Nothing. Try that one. See, man's patting himself on the back at what he's creating. He's not creating anything. He's reshaping. He's reblocking. He's reconnecting. He's not, he, he's not creating anything. God created everything that was out of absolutely nothing. That's God. 
Amen. Uh, very quickly, Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We, even us, we are created by Christ. Ephesians 3.9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So, question number one. Who is the creator? Jesus is. God is. Is Jesus God? By, by, the, by the mere fact that the Bible is ascribing the creation to Jesus, that in itself makes Jesus equal to God. Okay? He's not a lesser God. He was not a sub-God that God had to create. In a, so that be, there's this idea that God is heavenly spiritual and cannot touch matter. So God had to create a series of lesser gods that was farther removed from him. So that that God could create this world and that that God was Jesus. And that's one that Charles Taze Russell started believing in. And that's the Jesus of the Jehovah's Witness cult. But that's not who Jesus is. Mm -mm. He's equal. Jesus himself thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Amen. And I know it sounds like fundamental stuff, but. Is there something that you read tonight that you never knew before? I hope so. Because it never hurts to know these things. You're going to be asked questions by somebody. What God do you believe in? There's a situation right now. We're going to take some prayer requests in a minute. Where a family may be coming to our church. They're from South Korea. And one of them is, was not raised as a Christian. And does not know what Christianity is. So how do you teach somebody who doesn't even speak your language about the God that he knows absolutely nothing about? How do you do that? Just give them the word. Let God be the teacher. But it's got to be the word. Amen.